Good morning. Welcome to this Feb or February, April, this April 25th worship service for First Parish Church of Kingston, Massachusetts. I am the Reverend Monica Jacobson Tennyson. I serve this church as its minister. I use she, her pronouns. And I come to you today from the traditional and ancestral lands of the Patuxet Wampanoag. I send my greetings and my respect to the elders of the Wampanoag people who live and lead still in southeastern Massachusetts. Today's service is a reverse question box service. So instead of questions from the congregation, which then uh, I and other religious professionals try to answer, we have questions for the congregation. So for those of you in attendance and for some folks who emailed responses in ahead of time, there will be prompts that you can answer and our worship associate, Chris Page, and I will read those out so that we can all hear the wisdom that is in the Zoom room between us this morning. To move us into our time of worship, we will begin by lighting our chalices, and Chris Page has our chalice lighting words. There we go. Apologies. Our chalice lighting words this morning are from Julian Lepp. We seek our place in the world and the answers to our heart's deep questions. As we seek, may our hearts be open to unexpected answers. May the light of our chalice remind us that this is a community of warmth, of wisdom, and welcoming of multiple truths. Thank you, Chris. I'm gonna put those prompts in the chat box once more so you can be thinking about them if you haven't seen them yet. And I'm also gonna invite you to share in our opening hymn this morning. It's hymn number 1008, When Our Heart is in a Holy Place, which Kathy Kay and Tony Carlin have recorded for us. You are invited to sing, to listen, to hum, to make up harmonies, to dance, whatever is right for you this morning.
always good to get to hear a voice singing a hymn that we know. I am so appreciative for all the work over this last year to figure out how to make music in ways that make sense in these times. Chris has our reading for us this morning. Our reading is from Rania Maria Rilke. Be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves. Like locked rooms, and like books that are written in a very foreign language tongue. Do not now seek the answers, which cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. Thank you, Chris. We're gonna invite some living with a question and some sharing answers to the prompt. Something that gives me strength and resilience in hard times is. You can type into the chat what it is that comes up for you when you think about sources of strength and resilience. Maybe things you have called upon in this past year, maybe things you have called upon at other times in your life. And we'll give a little time for folks to type those in. While you're typing, I will share that uh, a response that was emailed into that question says, something that gives me strength and resilience in hard times is recognizing that I have overcome difficulties in the past and that others, those I know, as well as complete strangers who inspire me, have succeeded in the face of tremendous challenges. I see some great responses coming in, reaching out to the people closest to me. Family, higher power, friends, church, music, the power of enduring friendship and the strength of my marriage. Uh, in quotes, the, the timeless phrase, this too shall pass. The daily meditations of Richard Rohr, mm, those help me too. Support from friends, colleagues, also favorite books, Yes to favorite books. Yes to all of this. You all are saying such wonderful things. Relationships, family, friends, church friends who are usually the same as friends generally. Lots of great stuff here about leaning on other people, knowing ourselves to be connected and getting strength from all those relationships. Lovely. While I copy the second question, We'll see if we have other thoughts that are coming to us. I see family, friends, church community, and music. Yeah, music showing up as a theme here also. Very good. Our next prompt is what I'm grateful for in my life today is... Where are we finding gratitude in these moments? One emailed response, what I'm grateful for in my life today is that I have freedom to make choices, that I live in beautiful New England, and that I have been welcomed into a new community. This is somebody who is new to the Kingston Plymouth area and to First Parish. And I'm gonna see if we can get creative. I'm gonna invite Chris to read some of these responses along with me. So we're gonna try two spotlights and see if we can make Zoom work for us. So Chris, go ahead and read one and then we'll all do <clears throat> Family, friends, and church. Expressions of love and care. Something that gives me strength and resilience in hard times is my beautiful children and family. Nice. What I'm grateful for in my life today is sobriety, exclamation mark, vaccines, exclamation mark. 
My father and his brother died at 54. I am now 72. Gratitude for this church, my sister, my family, especially my two amazing adult children. Family, friends, vaccinations, a solid, if sometimes dark, sense of humor. Nice. Humor makes a lot of difference, doesn't it? We'll see if there are a few more gratitudes to be shared among us this morning. And while you may be thinking or typing about what you want to say to that, I will also put our third prompt in the box, my dream for the future of First Parish in Kingston. All right, I see a gratitude for spring and especially fall in New England. Yes, those beautiful seasons. So here is your third invitation, your dreams for the future. And the one that was emailed in in advance says, my dream for the future of First Parish in Kingston, that the congregation will continue working to embrace all aspects of diversity, not just the obvious ones, but all of them. And I see a dream for the future that this parish will be active here in Kingston and in the world that is flourishing in our 500th anniversary year. Nice. A growing congregation with many more children. We'll give lots of time. I know dreams can take a while to articulate. And these can be specific dreams, big dreams, far distant future dreams, local, near future sorts of dreams. I dream that this parish will celebrate everyone's uniqueness. Very nice. that we continue to be inclusive, open-minded, welcoming, and loving community. <clears throat> nice. I see some gratitudes for COVID vaccines, for a 50 year plus marriage, gratitude for having enough and some to share. to recognize our past, record our present, and preserve it for future generations. And dream about what is carried forward. Nice. That we become the moral compass for the community. Very good, a vision to be a guiding star and to keep being on the forefront of justice. Nice. A dream that we successfully reach out to members of the LGBTQ community and see more of them here with us. Lots of threads about justice and inclusion and helping to make a better world. Nice. I am going to pull up our next hymn and invite you to sing. It is hymn number 1066, O Brother Son, recorded for us by Paula Fisher. And you're welcome to keep articulating those dreams and to put them in the chat box and then we'll read what else has come in after we've had a chance to share this hymn. This hymn comes up for us because this week has been Earth Day. This week is sometimes referred to as Earth Week. And it is good for us to sing about our relationship to the natural world with these beautiful and ancient words. So you are invited to sing, to hum, to dance, to harmonize, whatever is good for you. Oh, sir. 
Thank you for sharing in that hymn. I see a few more responses for dreams for the future. A dream that members return to in-person services with renewed appreciation for who we are and what we can do, that they invest their energy and themselves in us. A dream that all are truly healed, restored and released from past oppressions and violence. I see all life matters in quotes. So the ability, I think, to say all life matters and know that we live in a world where that is deeply true, where every life does matter across race, across gender and sexual orientation, across all the different things that make us unique. A dream that the beauty of the music of this church continues. Yes, so important to have music in our lives. I want to share a, a few reflections that I have been having both about these prompts and about Earth Day, because each of those, something that gives me strength and resilience in hard times, something I'm grateful for in my life today and my dreams for the future, these are all connected to thinking about Earth Day for me. One of the teachers from whom I draw strength and wisdom is Joanna Macy, an American Buddhist, a white woman who is alive now and who teaches powerfully about loving the world and not being afraid to love the world and to face the truth of climate change, not letting our fear about what might happen break our connection. She says, being fully present to fear, to gratitude, and to all that is, this is the practice of mutual belonging. As living members of the living body of earth, we are grounded in that kind of belonging. Even when faced with cataclysmic changes, nothing can ever separate us from earth. We are already home. We are already home. So in my response today, I want to name one source of strength and resilience as the life we share on this earth. I am deeply grateful to be an earthling. Now, Earth Day is one day set aside to take special notice of our connection to the earth. And on the one hand, having a special day seems like a good idea, given how many people, especially how many people in the developed or industrialized countries, live lives that are pretty disconnected from the earth. Now, on the other hand, we might say, just one day? That is nowhere near enough time to spend being aware that we are part of this living system on this planet. I ran across a post on social media from someone with the username Around the World in Katie Days. A few excerpts from this post. 
this user writes, I really hate Earth Day. Why? Because I hate the idea that this capitalist colonial society only intentionally celebrates Earth for one day out of the year. And every year, as green and sustainable increasingly become marketing buzzwords, Earth Day gets co-opted by greenwashing corporations who want to sell you stuff. Let's not lose sight of what matters in this fight for the Earth and all her people. Here are some truths we need to center in our Earth activism. 100 companies are responsible for 71% of global emissions. And the majority of them are fossil fuel corporations. So while individual actions are great, we urgently need system change and we urgently need to build a world beyond fossil fuels. Another truth, black, brown and indigenous people are and have been bearing the brunt of pollution from the petrochemical industry for decades. Black people have the highest exposure to particulate matter pollution of any group in the US. And fossil fuel infrastructures like pipelines are one of the largest perpetuating factors of violence, trafficking and murder against indigenous women and girls. Racial justice is an extremely and arguably the most critical component to the fight for the climate. I read these and other facts that this person lifted up. And I found myself thinking first about the truth that while our individual choices to live more sustainably are valuable, we must not let ourselves be tricked into thinking they are the only or the most important thing for us to do. 100 companies are responsible for 71% of global emissions. What would it look like for us to require those companies to cut their emissions? Could it be done through stricter environmental laws, high fines and fees, carbon taxes, carbon cap and trade systems? Where is it that we can use our power as voters in a wealthy country that can influence those companies? And second, I am holding this truth that extractive capitalism is killing both the planet, and also Black, Brown, and Indigenous people. So in many ways, racial justice is environmental justice and vice versa. Yes, you should definitely reduce your household plastic use and drive your hybrid car and recycle. I do all those things, but none of us should stop there. We should treat all those personal habits like spiritual practices do them in part because they change you, because they make you aware, because they broaden your perspective or focus your commitment. Lately, I have been reading the work of Starhawk. Starhawk is a white American woman who is a writer, an eco-feminist, and a neo-paganist. And in one of her books, she shares this beautiful paragraph. She writes, Amory Lovins says that the primary design criteria he uses is the question, how do we love all the children? Not just our children, not just the ones who look like us or who have resources, not just the human children, but the young of birds and salmon and redwood trees. When we love all the children, when that love is truly sacred to us in the sense of being most important, then we have to take action in the world to enact that love. We are called to make the earth a place where all the children can thrive. So that final prompt, my dream for the future, not only the future of First Parish in Kingston, but the future for all, my dream is that we learn to ask the central question, how do we love all the children? How do we love all the generations that are coming? The humans and the trees and the birds and the fish and everyone. And this question can show up in every part of our lives. 
when faced with landscaping decisions, ask yourself, how does this landscape love all the children? When making decisions about buildings or events, ask, how do we love all the children? Love all the children with your political power. Love all the children by not using pesticides and herbicides. Love the children with solar panels. Love the children with phone banking. Love the children. They might be yours. They might be your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. They might be the children of your friends. They might be children of other species. Love the children you'll never even imagine by making choices to help create a world where they can thrive. How to begin? I asked myself this question, of course, and the thing that came into my mind was a poem. So to move toward the future, I defer to the words of David White, the Anglo-Irish poet, who says, start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing, close in the step you don't want to take. Start with the ground you know, the pale ground beneath your feet to own your own way into the conversation. Start with your own question. Give up on other people's questions. Don't let them smother something simple. To hear another's voice, follow your own voice. Wait until that voice becomes an intimate, private ear that can really listen to another. Start right now. Take a small step you can call your own. Don't follow someone else's heroics. Be humble and focused. Start close in. Don't mistake that other for your own. Start close in. Don't take the second step or the third. Start with the first thing. Close in. The step you don't want to take. As we each hold what it might mean for us to have gratitude and to dream of the future, let us remember that we live on this earth, this home that nothing can ever separate us from. May we love all the children of every species and of our own. May it be so. I want to give just a, one more chance for any further responses to our prompts. I'm gonna put them in the chat box once more. If you joined us later in the service and you wanna to respond to any of these questions, we would be happy to have your words and your wisdom in this service to lift up. You can put them in the chat and Chris and I will read them out. And it's okay also if you wanna think about those. While you are thinking, I'm gonna pass it over to Chris to introduce our offering. This morning's offering words are with gratitude. It's words from Reverend Dr. Victoria Weinstein. And she invites us uh, to give our offering today and reminds us to make our pledges of financial support for the coming year. Reverend Weinstein writes, the purpose of the church is to encourage all who gather there to grow more generous in spirit and in action. This is the great end of all the world's faith traditions to bring human beings closer to the divine by acts of creation and compassion. We now take our offering 
that allows us to exercise that all important generosity of spirit, an offering that will support this self-supporting church and its many ministries. The gifts of the congregation will be most gratefully received. Thank you. I see a, another gratitude has come in via the chat, a gratitude from Casey who says, I'm grateful that I got to visit my grandma and grandpa. Yes, more gratitude for these relationships in our lives. I'm gonna put a link in the chat box to the online pledge information. If you have not yet had a chance to make that pledge of financial support for the coming church year, there is a link there for that. And I just wanna introduce a little bit the operatory music today. Joyce Poley, the same composer who wrote When Our Heart Is In A Holy Place, wrote a beautiful piece called Keepers of the Earth. And I am going to share that with all of us this morning. This version that uh, I was able to find on YouTube comes from what was at the time called the UU Musicians Network, now called the uh, Association of UU Music Ministries. They are folks who gather as music directors and music makers in Unitarian Universalism once a year in non-pandemic times and sing through and record the singing through of new pieces that have been written for congregational singing and for choral anthems. So you will hear the piece being introduced and there's some rustling of paper, but the sound quality is pretty good and it's an easy piece to learn. So you're invited to pick it up and to sing along with all these music directors from all over the country who gathered in 2014 to share this piece. And I do see a few more things are coming in in the chat. So after we've had a chance to share this, we will read out the other responses to the prompts.
I see one more gratitude in the chat. We are grateful for our wonder da wonderful daughter-in-law who together with our son and daughter have been tremendously helpful to us. More gratitudes for family. And I will simply add my gratitude for music, for the music that Unitarian Universalists make all over the place and share with each other, which echoes so many of the gratitudes that you all have shared. I am going to pass it over to Chris with our chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish our chalice this morning with words from Dr. Michael Schuler. We have reached the end of this time for the gathering of memory and for letting the imagination play with future possibilities. We have enjoyed magic moments and edified each other. Shall it be concluded then? Or will this adventure now commenced continue? Our separate paths converging, meeting, merging in the unending quest for love more perfect, the joyous struggle for meaning more sufficient and life more abundant. Is this ending to be an ending or merely prelude to new, more glorious beginnings? I pose the question, in your hearts lie the answer. Thank you, Chris, for sharing those words. I am going to stop our recording now so that we can have a time to share joys and sorrows with each other.